Welcome back to Winning in the Wind. I'm your host, Keith. This is the third video in our Extreme Spread and Standard Deviation series. For this video, I told you I was going to talk about which measurement I use, Extreme Spread or Standard Deviation. If I can take just a moment here to give you some insight into making videos, I've been trying to make this video for a couple of days, and the result so far has been eye-peelingly boring. I'm talking watching grass grow waiting for water to boil, or paint to dry level boring. So I've decided to start from scratch. While I was thinking about that, I decided to tackle the echo in this room. I've done some work here and would appreciate a comment if you think the audio is better. With all that behind us, let's talk about the elephant in the room. What is good enough? Is it single digit standard deviation? Single digit extreme spread? What should you strive for? I'm not going to bore you with the details of what each one is or means. I know you have access to the internet if you want to look it up. But let's talk about how to use them and what I use. Is extreme spread or standard deviation more important for long range shooting? Let's answer that by first considering your context. I like to think of long range context in terms of systems. Let's look at those systems. The first, a closed loop system is one where an input is made and the output is evaluated in deciding what the next input will be. A great example is F-class shooting or PRS when you can see your own impacts. We get to see where the prior shot hit and adjust accordingly. As an intelligent person, if the point of impact is slowly moving downward, you will eventually aim higher, would you not? I do, and almost every F-class shooter I know does. Does it matter if the point of impact shift is caused by the average velocity changing or the wind? Of course not. We are simply attempting to get the bullet holes where we want them. The other system is called an open loop system. In an open loop system, all inputs are made without the benefit of the result of the prior input. Great examples are long range hunting and long range bench rest. Now that we have defined the type of system we are using, let's decide which measurement means the most to us. Let's start with an open loop system. If you haven't watched the first video on how to use a ballistics calculator to determine the impact of velocity spreads on long range vertical, I'll put a card up in the corner here somewhere. Referring to the results obtained in the first video, we want to have less than 16 feet per second extreme spread for all shots to fall within four inches for the seven millimeter 184 grain burger at 2,800 feet per second. But is that what we really need? With an open loop system, that doesn't make any sense at all. Extreme spread doesn't even acknowledge the average velocity, which would be really bad for a situation where you don't get sighting shots. Think of it this way. If you load up 10 or 20 shots and chronograph them, then take the same load and shoot it for the life of the barrel. What did the extreme spread tell you? If the barrel life is 2000 shots, it's like randomly pulling out 10 or 20 of those and expecting every other group you pull out to perform exactly the same. Fortunately, statistics has a built-in prediction system that allows us to make educated guesses based on random samples. The cornerstone of that is standard deviation. I want to emphasize that we are talking about making predictions from imperfect numbers. Your results will vary. The key to using standard deviation is understanding that it is a distance from the average. It can and does go both up and down. So remember, this is a plus and minus affair. While we're talking about statistics in general, I want to talk about accuracy. If you've never read this book, it's well worth the read. It's easy to get wrapped around the axle thinking that because it's math, that statistics has to be right. It's a discipline in mathematics that has usefulness, but it can be quite misleading. Oh, right. We're about to talk about making predictions. All right, cutting out all the math or mass for those of you in the United Kingdom, we first have to define our confidence level or risk tolerance in order to make a prediction and find a fit with our performance requirement. For example, if we want to accept only a 95% chance that our shot will fall in our desired impact zone, we would have to use two times the standard deviation, plus or minus. In shot count terms, that would equate to an average of 21 out of 22 shots being within our desired velocity extreme spread. If we want more certainty than that, we have to add additional multiples of the standard deviation. Okay, let's take our 16 feet per second extreme spread as an example. 
If we want to determine our required standard deviation, we first have to cut that in half. Why? Because standard deviation goes both plus and minus. So we have 8 feet per second to, to divide up between as many standard deviations as necessary. If 21 out of 22 is good enough for us, then we would divide by 2 and our target standard deviation would be 4 feet per second. If we wanted more confidence in that, we could use three standard deviations, which would give us 369 out of 370 shots inside our desired extreme spread on average. In that case, our standard deviation requirement would be 2.6 feet per second. Time to pump the brakes here a bit. Have you ever seen a standard deviation at 2.6? It's pretty rare to see, mostly because we use such small samples when we chronograph. That is a downside to using standard deviation. Because of the nature of the calculation, it is intensely sensitive to sample size. If you're going to try to get really good data, I would recommend a string of at least 25 shots. That's pretty easy for F-class shooters like me. Just run the chronograph during a practice string. For the average hunter or bench rest shooter that may not want to expend the components in barrel life to get such a large sample, I'd say do 10 shots and be willing to accept a little higher number, say one foot per second greater. That is not a mathematically sound way to do things, but it is a best guess based on my observations over time. In the end, it's up to you where you set your design requirements for an open loop system. Just be aware that the velocity requirement will change with ballistic coefficient, range, and your vertical dispersion requirements. As a general rule, velocity spreads have less effect on point of impact variation at shorter ranges. Now, let's get into the meaty part, closed loop systems. I know there are people out there that are rubbing their hands together ready to leap upon the keyboard and tell me I'm wrong whether I say extreme spread or standard deviation is more important. I have a surprise for them. Both of them are important, plus one additional measurement that I'll describe in a minute or two. Look at the extreme spread for some basic stuff, like understanding if my loading practices are appropriate or whether I have a major malfunction going on. I can do that by comparing to a known standard deviation from prior testing. I also use standard deviation in the same way one would for an open loop system except I use much larger samples that give a more statistically significant standard deviation. Let me be completely transparent on this. I think neither extreme spread nor standard deviation fully represents our needs while shooting within a closed loop system. Have you ever shot a long string and found that the average velocity creeps up or down as the barrel heats? I'm no expert on why it does that, but I've never had a barrel that didn't do it, at least to some extent regardless of which powder is used. Because of this, I use the concept of change from shot to shot. I know that I can rely upon my intelligence to guide aiming decisions if the average is changing. So, does extreme spread for the entire string matter under this concept? Maybe a little, but not really. What matters more is where the bullets impact relative to the last shot or prior several shots. I explain it this way. I don't like surprise parties. I want the impact to move predictably and as slowly as possible. Here's an example. Let's say I want to control the vertical to no more than 4 inches, again excluding all other factors. In this case, I'm saying that I don't want the point of impact to stray more than 2 inches from the previous shot before I can correct. Well, using what we found in the first video, I want the shot to shot velocity to change no more than 8 feet per second before I can correct. Now I'm not super smart and can't tell most of the time if a change in point of impact is velocity or condition related, so I would further cut that number in half if I wanted to be 100% certain my waterline would be no more than 4 inches tall. This shot to shot change is similar to and somewhat compatible with the concepts of standard deviation. The only difference is that this method allows for more variation in the average velocity as it crawls up or down during a long string of fire. As a result, I can accept a much larger extreme spread in standard deviation and still shoot excellent scores at long range. If you're still rubbing your hands together, now's your chance to go to the comments section and tell me how I'm all wrong. On the other hand, if you learned something from this video, please like and subscribe. Our next video in the series will be on how to reduce your velocity spreads in load development through finding the best powder charge. Until then, shoot straight and I'll see you in the next video.